to this month's Ag Sector Council webinar, Fish, Forks, and Finance, on the importance of wild fish, especially from small-scale fishers. I am Barbara Best from USAID's Bureau of Economic Growth, Education, and Environment in the Office of Forestry and Biodiversity, and we are very pleased to have or organized this event with the Bureau for Food Security. Today we will explore the importance of wild fisheries to food security, nutrition, and livelihood, and the approaches that are being taken to restore and enhance the natural productivity of fisheries. There's growing interest in improving fisheries management, not only by the public sector, but also by the private sector through impact investments, as modern management approaches demonstrate their effectiveness. Now, AgriLinks is the knowledge sharing platform for USAID's Bureau for Food Security. These Ag Sector Council events are one of AgriLinks regular events. And to learn more, please visit agrilinks.org. To learn about any of the upcoming events, you can also subscribe to the newsletter on the home page. Before I introduce our experts, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Please use the chat box to connect with other participants and to ask questions throughout the event. We will note each question and pose as many as possible to the experts during the Q&A session. If you have technical issues at any time, please private chat with the KDAD AV tech rather than in the group chat box. To do so, go to the host box above the chat box, hover over AV tech, and click start private chat. You can also use this feature to initiate conversations with other participants as well. And if you would like to, please treat your thoughts on the content to Ag Events. Our experts today include Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist for USAID's Bureau for Food Security, who will provide an introduction to this topic. Brett Jinks, President and CEO of RARE. RARE and Bloomberg recently signed a Global Development Alliance with USAID Philippines. Justice Odoi, the Environmental Specialist at USAID Ghana. And Brian Crawford, Chief of Party for the Ghana Sustainable Fisheries Management Project of Feed the Future Activity. So I'll provide information on some new resources and tools that are available for USA staff and partners on wild fisheries. Before we start, let me just announce that we will have an Ask Ag online chat next week on April 27th at this time to further discuss impact investments in wild fisheries that will allow us to do a deeper dive and discussion on that topic. At this point, let me turn it over to Rob Bertram. Thank you very much, Barbara, and good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today to introduce the webinar and share a little bit of an overview uh, about the importance of wild fisheries to both food security and nutrition. And I want in particular to thank Barbara, who um, has been the source of fantastic advice and knowledge about fisheries for many, many years. Um, for me, and today is no exception. Um, Sustainable management of wild fisheries, and especially small-scale fisheries, is critical to achieving local food security and poverty reduction in many developing countries. And this includes many of the Feed the Future focus countries and aligned countries. Fish are some of the most nutritious foods, and fish are often staples in many developing countries. Yet, wild fish have often been overlooked in international and national food security discussions and action plans. I'm glad to say, though, that that situation appears to be changing as the evidence of the importance of wild fish is growing and the importance of fish overall grows from both wild caught and aquaculture produced uh, systems. This slide shows you that fish are the world's most widely traded and val most valuable food products. According to the FAO, the export value of fish from developing countries is greater than the export value of rice, tea, bananas, sugar, and cocoa combined. So it just gives you a sense for how critical this is as a source of income for many developing countries. At the global scale, though, about half the fish produced comes from wild fish, the other half from farm fish. But something like two-thirds of that farm fish comes from China alone. In many developing countries, the contribution of wild fish is greater than the, that of farmed fish. 
And this is especially true if one takes into account the catch taken from small-scale fisheries. Uh, fish are also critical uh, in terms of uh, nutritional outcomes uh, for many poor people in the developing world. Uh, for example, in this slide, you can see that maternal fish during uh, intake during pregnancy, along with the duration of breastfeeding, are independently associated with better early child development outcomes. The more fish a mother eats, the better off her child is going to be. It's also worth pointing out here that different fish have different nutritional profiles. And often, many of the small fish that are eaten by poor people in small-scale fisheries, they're eaten whole. And they are the most nutritious because they include the bones, the eyes, and other sources of critical uh, nutrients. Now, you can see here, I think probably many of you have heard that how important fish are. But this gives you a sense for how much of the animal protein in critical developing countries where AID is active comes from fish. Uh, in several African and Asian countries, fish provide more than half of that animal protein supply. And FAO says that nearly 3 billion people rely on fish for a substantial part of their animal protein. That is greater than 20 percent. And new research is suggesting that the contribution of wild fish to food security may be even higher than previously thought in many developing countries. So for example, new research from a 10-year study just published involving over 50 countries and 400 researchers indicates that the contribution of wild fish is significantly higher, in some cases up to 50 percent higher than previously reported. So this catch from small-scale fisheries though it's not often captured in the, no pun intended, in the uh, reports that are produced uh, and, and turned into the FAO. And this is especially true for some of the really critical fish that women uh, take uh, by gleaning near shore and, and that would never be counted in production, but are actually critical in terms of the food security outcomes that we care about. And um, it's also important to remember that it's really coastal waters that are the, really the most productive ones. And as you can see here, the red color shows the highest level of, of fishery productivity. New research is indicating that the natural productivity is even higher than we thought, however. Uh, and you can see around Africa, uh, West and East Africa, in Southeast Asia, and parts of Latin America, very substantial impacts. I think this also underscores, Barbara and, and colleagues, the, the important interactions between terrestrial-based agricultural activities and the health and sustainability and productivity of nearshore fisheries. So we, we want to keep that in our view as well, in terms of how we manage things on land as well as in the sea. Oops, sorry. And then um, I want to, one of the most important points today is we have a positive message. We can po affect positive change. This is uh, based on re a, a recent analysis of fishery uh, management in, in the developed world. But you can see here that the uh, opportunity to recover ocean productivity through improved fisheries management is really very substantial. In this case, leading to a 23% increase in food production. 112 percent more biomass, and an astonishing 315 percent increase in profits. So I mean, no re there's no wonder that there's growing interest in improving wild fisheries, not only in the public sector, but also in the private sector, where profitability is, is always uh, you know, very high on the agenda. And things like secure tenure and managed access can demonstrate their, have demonstrated their effectiveness in, in uh, restoring and enhancing and sustaining food uh, fish uh, populations. Now, it's important, too, to remember that there are some aspects of fisheries that are similar to what we also think about in agriculture. And in agric uh, agriculture, in the U view of the US Congress, actually includes wild foods, such as wild fish, as well as crops and livestock. Uh, first, we have seen that transform transformational change can come through securing land tenure in smallholder farming systems. Well, similar 
approaches with marine tenure and managed access are also critical to secure small-scale fishers and producers and can be similarly transformational. Um, this, the importance of this securing tenure was uh, highlighted in a recently published FAO voluntary guidelines for securing small-scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty reduction. Another point is that a systems approach that we know is uh, an essential part of the way we consider agriculture is also true in a fisheries approach. Uh, whether we're thinking about enhancing and sustaining productivity or conferring and enhancing climate resilience, an agroecological system or an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries makes sense. Um, third, empowering producers, farmer associations, but also fisher associations through co-management of common resources and, and other collective efforts can improve value chains inclusive development outcomes, and the sustainability. And I want to also add here that all of us dealing with land-based agriculture are thinking about climate all the time now. We talk about climate smart agriculture. We say similar issues affecting uh, fisheries with coastal vulnerabilities associated with sea level rise and storm frequency and magnitude. We see issues around freshwater availability being less predictable saltwater intrusion, and of course acidification uh, and the impacts that has uh, on shellfish, on corals, and across the, the ecosystem. So there's a lot of parallels. Finally, uh, I want to flag for you that this information and more is included in a new USAID resource, Fishing for the Future, the Importance of Food Security and Nutrition, that is being launched today from this webinar. Uh, a key feature of this briefing book is for our programming is a description of the importance of fisheries, uh, what they play in nine of the important Feed the Future focused countries. Barbara is going to say uh, more about the book and other resources later in the webinar. Finally, um, I just want to say from the vantage point of Feed the Future that I feel pretty confident that the importance of animal source foods is going to grow as we look forward in the, uh, let's call it Feed the Future 2.0 as we move into the next phase and the next administration, hopefully. And I think issues around nutrition, income, and gender, all of which play out very significantly in fisheries. We didn't mention, for example, that 50% of the labor in many small-scale fisheries is provided by women. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And I think that as we look forward to thinking about our research investments in Feed the Future, we need to think holistically about the connections across aquaculture and fisheries, uh, around the synergies uh, in fish systems generally, and seek to develop a really strategic uh, research agenda going forward that's going to uh, help us all and the focus our partner countries achieve their food security goals and have fish play an important role in so doing. So thanks, everybody, and I uh, look forward to a great uh, seminar today. Oh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Brett Jenks. Brett is, the, as Barbara said, the president and CEO of RARE. And, and Brett, over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bertram. I guess I'll call you Rob uh, and Barbara uh, for all your leadership. It's great that you've um, provided a, a terrific introduction and context to this really important topic. And um, it's great to hear that fish is going to become a key uh, feed the future priority in years to come, as, as I think you just uh, predicted. So um, welcome news for the whole development uh, community. So. Uh, essentially, I want to talk. Uh, I just want to continue where um, Rob left off, and that is with a uh, sense of hope and a sense of optimism for um, uh, for small-scale fisheries uh, around the world. Essentially, I want to talk uh, just briefly um, about four things. First, further outlining the problem and uh, describing one uh, one at least one solution. Second, I want to share a story to illustrate what what this potential solution looks like uh, in action. And then um, no good idea is complete without uh, the ability to replicate it and, and scale it. And then finally, I'll close with some thoughts on how we might um, finance uh, 
small-scale fishery re reform uh, at scale. So, so with that, um, I'll begin. The problem and the solution. It, it's fair to say that um, wild fish stocks are crashing uh, all around the world due in great part to poor management. Billions of people, often the poorest and most marginalized, as Rob outlined, depend on fish as a significant source of protein and other nutrients. And while climate change and population growth are going to exacerbate this problem in the years to come, uh, it's definitely time for us to turn our attention to this, in many ways, neglected area of development opportunity. This slide outlines um, what uh, is projected for the future of Mozambican uh, small-scale fisheries. Uh, in this country, we predict about a 70% decrease in fish protein availability by 2030, uh, simply as a result of overfishing. Overfishing is also really important for rural livelihoods. In Mozambique, like many tropical nations, 99% of fishers are artisanal. And they land a very high percentage of Mozambique's catch, in this case, about 88%, most of which is consumed locally. So conventional wisdom says that addressing the overfishing crisis usually means prioritizing reforms of industrial fisheries. And while clearly reforming industrial fisheries is key, the facts in countries like Mozambique provide a slightly different story. Small-scale fisheries in many nations play a critical role in food security, employment, nutritional health, and of course biodiversity conservation, given that most known biodiversity is found right along these coastlines. Unfortunately, the challenges of small-scale fisheries are complex, and Rob outlined several of these. Clearly, open access, which leads to a tragedy of the commons. Uh, lack of enforcement um, is clearly a challenge when you're trying to uh, provide any sort of market reform. Uh, catch is highly disaggregated, which makes it difficult to improve the value, to work on supply chain improvement or access to markets which is not unlike smallholder agriculture before a uh, major land tenure movement years ago. Clearly not for the faint of heart. Finally, there's a pervasive lack of data, which makes informed decision making and even basic management uh, quite difficult. So these are the challenges. But as Rob said, there's a great deal of hope. This is another analysis recently published by Chris Costello and company at University of California, Santa Barbara. And basically what this shows um, is arguably the most complete set of global fisheries data created to date. This includes data from about 5,000 of the world's 17,000 fisheries, uh, roughly. And what it shows, um, the y-axis there is basically a measure of fishery health, to keep this simple. And the chart illustrates uh, the current downward trend of global fish stocks, and then projects recovery scenarios under different management approaches. Under the, the, the red at the bottom, you see um, the business as usual uh, scenario, where the per percentage continues to drop over the next 30 years, as do profits. And it's important to note that small-scale fisheries are in the worst shape of all of these fisheries uh, in many cases. The blue line provides uh, the contrast and, and essentially uh, a, a, a great source of hope. And this is the line that shows what would happen if much of the world adopted rights-based fisheries management scenarios, which include secure tenure, um, catch shares, quotas uh, for uh, local fishermen. So if we think about how transformative land tenure has been for smallholder farmers and all that Feed the Future has learned from its work in this area over the years, um, marine tenure would offer a similar promise in many ways for small-scale fishers. Given how many people depend on these fisheries uh, for um, daily protein, this is both a big challenge and, um, if addressed, a really big opportunity. Securing marine tenure can be a critical component of fishery recovery. And I just want to illustrate a way that uh, RARE, with a group of partners, uh, including um, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the governments of Belize, Brazil, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Mozambique uh, have all been working together to begin to replicate uh, a model like this. So first, local authorities allocate territorial use rights for local fishers, which uh, the acronym would be TERFs, which is fitting. You might also just call this managed access, as they do in some countries, or marine tenure. 
This turns an open access regime into uh, essentially an asset that local communities will go great distances to help protect and eventually to manage. Next, local fishers design and begin to protect uh, no-take reserves inside or sometimes adjacent to their turfs. Some people call these no-take zones or fish banks because if no one fishes in the area, uh, what's created is essentially a natural annuity. And as the fish population rebounds inside the fish bank, the spillover accrues to licensed local fishermen. So the better they manage the system, the bigger the economic benefit. So this approach uh, we've called Fish Forever, and it essentially addresses these four major challenges uh, for small-scale fisheries. Open access, lack of enforcement, disaggregation, uh, and uh, lack of data. So that's the introduction. Um, I'd like to illustrate this um, with a story about uh, the Philippines. So let me introduce you to Tian Sempran. He's a rare trained behavior change agent. We call them conservation fellows uh, from Hambongan Island in the Philippines. Tian was the son of a local fisherman uh, and a number of years ago began to see the decline uh, near collapse of Hambongan's local fisheries. So he started working closely with um, his municipal president and rare. Uh, we worked over the course of uh, a complete year training Tian and 12 other local leaders from 12 other municipalities in how to run what we call a pride campaign, which is designed to instill a sense of civic pride in local communities. Um, it's a social marketing approach more common to public health practices that I'm sure AID uh, uh, um, partners are, are very familiar with. And this is increasingly used in the uh, environmental space to um, motivate behavior change. And in this case, to motivate the adoption of a sustainable fishing practice. So after a year of planning and design and training, um, I happened to be there this opening day, uh, opening of his campaign with 2,500 uh, local citizens uh, filling the stands, uh, local mayors standing up and pledging their allegiance to um, uh, creating these new systems for sustainable fisheries. We filed outside and led by Malloy, the panther grouper mascot, traveled down to the waterfront where we then, um, first time I've ever seen parade floats that actually float, we circumnavigated the uh, no-take zone uh, and we were able to uh, create a, a sense among the whole population of just what the opportunity here um, actually was and the technique for recovering fisheries. Now, Tian was one of 13 local leaders from 13 municipalities trained to employ this particular approach, pride campaign plus turf plus reserve, uh, et cetera. And um, they achieved pretty significant results. On average, across those 13 sites, while there was a wide range and one very big outlier um, that saw a 433% increase in biomass in just a year, which we know is an outlier and probably not correct, we assume a big school of mackerel swam through that day. Um, the average was 38.8% uh, increase in fish biomass inside those no-take zones over uh, that first year. But that shouldn't be a surprise. Sarah Lester from University of California, Santa Barbara, published a paper in 09 where she aggregated uh, 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, did a meta-analysis, and concluded that on average over five to 10 years, no-take zones uh, have the potential to increase biomass 446 uh, percent. Turfs and no-take areas are not only a promising way of um, recovering fisheries, um, but they're also a great way of restoring the natural productivity of the ecosystem. So this isn't just marine tenure, it's also about ecosystem restoration. And you can see increase in density, size, and, and diversity uh, supported here. The fact that local leadership, social cohesion, self-enforcement, and turfs and quotas motivate sustainable fishing is also not a surprise. Here's another paper by Nico Gutierrez, who is a, a protege of Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom, where he looked at hundreds of very successful small-scale fisheries and, and identified uh, what they all had in common. Um, and those are the uh, common attributes uh, in ranked order. Um, which should sound familiar. So 
based on some early initial uh, successes and, and a, a, a clear opportunity to begin to boost uh, fish populations, uh, create motivated uh, communities of fishermen collaborating together to, to manage uh, their fisheries in a more sustainable fashion, we began to think about replication uh, and eventually um, exploring ways of scaling uh, the Fish Forever uh, turf reserve model. The great news is, um, as of last year, a result of a long-term partnership with Environmental Defense Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Government of Belize, uh, and others, um, the Government of Belize adopted this turf reserve system, what they call managed access, uh, nationwide. Um, the, the, the Cabinet of Belize mandated uh, the rollout uh, over the, the in, in the coming years, and so we'll look forward to seeing um, just how successful this program is. But that's great news for Belize, and hopefully a sign of good things to come in other countries. In um, th thanks to Bloomberg Philanthropies and a GDA partnership with USAID, as well as the Waite Foundation and others, this approach is now taking off in the Philippines uh, as well as in Indonesia. By year's end, we hope to have 20 turf reserves up and running across these two countries. And this is really just the beginning of the proof points and the momentum building to eventually replicate these on a much broader scale. In the Philippines, we're partnering with local government units right now in uh, more than 20 municipalities of the 37 where we've been active working on uh, no-take zone pr uh, uh, protection and, and propagation. And so we're now beginning to uh, think about what it would look like if we were to uh, find a way to roll this program out uh, with municipal presidents along the uh, much of the coast of the Philippines. And so we're now beginning to uh, envision scale. And you know, this is what, what we imagine it looking like. But the big question is, how can we justify the kind of investment that would be required to finance replicating a program like this uh, nationally. So recently, we've begun to look at the costs and the benefits of this kind of effort and a potential return uh, on that investment. And here's what we've started to see. If 650 coastal municipalities successfully adopted this approach in the Philippines, and we saw the kinds of long-term uh, results that we expect to see based on our early work, we would see nearly a 100% increase in fisher revenue over about a 15-year period. We would potentially see 350,000 families removed uh, from poverty, a 50% increase in uh, fish meals per person per month, and a slight drop in greenhouse gases from protein production. The value in economic terms would be in the billions of dollars, and according to our analysis, well worth the investment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute before I wrap up. But then the question is, well, how would we scale the program? Um, so we've been thinking about a three-pronged approach, which should not be um, unfamiliar to many of you. One, government adoption and promotion. Uh, second, value chain improvement and the provision of private capital. And third, delivery efficiency. So let me just briefly show you uh, what I mean. So first. Government adoption. In Mozambique, thanks to the Nordic Development Fund, RARE is embedded now in the Ministry of Fisheries, where we're working with uh, 16 IDEPA, which is the Small Scale Fisheries Department staff, who are working full time on this project, while 20 plus other IDEPA staff are receiving training on fisheries management and social marketing uh, techniques that we use in these PRIDE programs. Together, we're launching six pilots uh, along the, the coast. So that's one example of uh, government adoption. To ensure the quality of the program while uh, replicating it along the coast, we're developing a set of replicable tools and uh, uh, adaptable manuals and training curricula that can be modified locally so that we can build capacity and then over time utilize uh, new technologies and hybrid training techniques to drive down the cost of delivery to each of these communities. And then finally, um, value chain improvements and the provision of private capital is going to be key over time. Everyone thinks about uh, the J-curve, this, this infamous challenge. Some people call it the valley of death, the sacrifice that fishermen have to make in the short term so that fish can recover 
uh, before they um, reap the benefits of uh, better fisheries management. So with Fish Forever, we're working on a variety of ways to reduce the depth of the pain and uh, boost the eventual upside. Um, this by helping create access to better markets, premium pricing where possible, and by helping fishermen cooperate as a way, uh, in part, to, to reduce uh, their costs. So recently, uh, one, one uh, quick example would be uh, we launched with a group of other partners a Sustainable Seafood Week uh, with some of the leading hotel chefs in Manila in partnership with USAID and Bloomberg Philanthropies and others. And for the first time, we connected these high-end markets uh, very meaningfully uh, with uh, local communities that for the first time ever were selling into uh, this, this particular supply chain. And as, as a pilot, it was a great success. And it's leading us to um, a number of new ideas for how to invest in uh, boosting those supply chains. Which leads me to um, just a couple final points. One, beginning next year, we hope to launch um, uh, what, what we believe will be the first, if not one of the first, a $20 million uh, private fund to invest in uh, small-scale fisheries enterprises along the coast of Philippines excuse me, and Indonesia. And the goal is simply to bring private capital for the first time to these disaggregated small-scale fisheries where turf reserves and community organization makes investments in this space less risky. Over time, our hope is that this $20 million investment and the proof points that it provides will de-risk the market enough to bring in more conventional investors uh, over time. And so that's the three-part approach. Uh, government adoption, reducing delivery costs, and then eventually bringing, de-risking the market enough to bring private capital to bear. So I'll just close with one final point, and that is, if we're going to think about major, this is a multi-local uh, solution, and this requires a heavy lift to scale nationwide. Really, that's inevitably the big challenge that we all face. And so we've begun to think about um, how we would potentially uh, finance um, uh, an endeavor like this in 650 municipalities. So we're beginning to work with the National Economic Development Agency of the Philippines to, to chart out uh, what this would look like. This is our, uh, the, the beginning of a, of a four-month project, but this is our initial hypothesis that says over 15 years, it, as you see here, if you follow the, the dotted line, that's the trajectory um, assumed of municipal uh, fisher revenues. The deep uh, J-curve uh, which costs out at about $2.6 billion, is what conventional wisdom would be, uh, a huge sacrifice on the part of small-scale fishers, and the kind of J-curve that most politicians or economists would just sort of uh, laugh at and move on. It's just too big a hurdle. It's too much to ask local fishermen to make that kind of sacrifice, or it's a huge burden to finance that transition. We believe that there's several things that can be done from local enforcement to secure tenure, to value chain improvements that pull up that J-curve, that reduce the pain, and that make large-scale, small-scale fishery reform uh, far more feasible. And then finally, I would say that the only way this ends up getting financed would be through some form of blended uh, finance, where philanthropy enables the process to get started, the government buys in and begins to spend its own resources on this approach, partnering with uh, multilateral and bilateral uh, aid institutions who can help bring expertise and, and per perhaps concessional financing to de-risk the market so that eventually the private sector can uh, help uh, so that at the end of the day this is managed um, by the um, private sector, the fishermen themselves under a modicum of regulations. So in summary, um, I would argue that Feed the Future has an incredibly promising future in small-scale fisheries, uh, and that all that it has learned about um, small-scale, uh, small-holder uh, ag tenure and cooperative development and even finance would make a material difference in terms of food security, biodiversity, conservation, and livelihood protection, uh, if not creation, uh, throughout the developing world. So um, thanks.
Now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Justice Adoy from the USAID Ghana Mission. Thank you, Brett. Um, the next presentation is going to give a little bit details in terms of what USAID Ghana is doing within the World Fisheries. Um, just like previous speakers have mentioned, generally world per capita fish consumption is increasingly steadily. And similarly to Ghana, um, annual per capita consumption of fish is high. Fish plays an important role in meeting Ghana's food security and nutrition needs. About 60% of total animal fish protein in Ghana comes from fish. And fish is highly nutritious and provides a valuable supplement for diversified and nutritional diet. It provides not only high value protein, but also represents an increasing important source of wide range of essential micronutrients, minerals, and fatty acids. Despite Despite the importance of fisheries in Ghana, um, the sector is faced with many challenges that we need to work through as a country with support from the donor or development agencies. Among the challenges, we have the issue of open access, um, where people can easily jump in and then become fishermen and then make the best out of it. We also have the issue of overfishing and overcapacity. The other issue is with poor governance. And specifically to Ghana, another issue is with the full subsidies, which encourages other people to join. And just like other countries, Ghana also has um, the issue with IUU fishing, which is the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. The next slide talks about the loss that Ghana has experienced in terms of 100,000 metric tons of fish protein in the last decade. And if you look at the, the figure on your right, you could see the significant decline of fisheries catch, um, particularly for the Sardinia in Ghana. This really shows the kind of issues that Ghana needs to deal with. And it tells you that there are things that, that we need to work on because there are risks that we need to overcome. Um, if you look at some of the risks in terms of the decline and the impact it will have on the economy, about 4.5% of GDP comes from fisheries, and that was reported in 2000. Um, in recent years, it's about 1.5 due to the rebasing of the economy of Ghana. Annual yield is about 344,000 metric tons. And the annual, um, about 74% from the small scale fisheries. In terms of livelihood, um, fisheries contribute to about 2.2 million indirect um, workforce, you know, employment to people, and directly to about 210,000. It's also, like I said initially, it's an issue of food security and nutrition. And it's a good source of protein for vulnerable households in Ghana. To respond to some of these challenges and the other coastal management issues within Ghana, USAID Ghana developed the Fisheries and Coastal Management Project which consists of three project, integrated projects. The first one is the Sustainable Fisheries Management Project, which is being implemented by the University of Rhode Island. The next presenter will talk very, a lot about this um, particular project. The other project is the Coastal Sustainable Landscapes, which looks at coastal management issues in relation to mangroves 
and forest related activities and estuaries to, because these are also important for the fish keep. The other project, which is the last one, it's a capacity building project which focuses on building long term and short term capacity and providing a hub within a local university that will support future capacity to sustain. Because one of the things that has been identified is the capacity for the management of fisheries is quite weak in Ghana. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce um, Brian Crawford, who is the chief of party for the USAID Ghana Sustainable Fisheries Management Project, and he will give you more details in terms of what the project wishes to achieve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justice, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, today and this morning. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about the uh, Sustainable Fisheries Management Project. And simply put, the major goal of this initiative is to rebuild targeted marine fisheries. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about what stocks we're working on. Gen specifically, we're working on the small pelagics. These are kind of like the anchovies the sardines and the mackerels, which are very important for food security and local food supply in, in Ghana. And the project contributes to Government of Ghana's national policies and development objectives for fisheries and is supported through the President Obama's Feed the Future uh, initiative. Now, one of the things that's very important is, is when we look globally, we know that um, demand for fish is going to increase greatly both in Asia and Africa, um, basically because of uh, economic development and population growth. And what this means is, is that we, it's even more important that we really focus on fisheries management to uh, maintain the wild caught fish supplies uh, for these areas. Now, getting back to Ghana, one of the things that's happening, and I just showed you the figure where the landings, particularly of the small pelagic stocks, are in significant decline. And the reason for this is that we see effort, the number of canoes, the number of other vessels are increasing in all the fleets fishing in the marine waters of Ghana, creating that problem. Now, what we see here is a chart of kind of what are some of the challenges for fisheries management. Uh, and as you increase, increase fishing effort over time uh, with kind of uh, new uh, types of fisheries areas, basically the yield goes up, uh, but when you hit a certain period, uh, a certain level of effort, then the, the yields start to go down. And that's the situation we have in here in Ghana. So we have lots of social costs, economic costs, and losses occurring in the fishery. And the government of Ghana uh, would like to go back to uh, a place on this chart where we have greater yields and greater profitability in the fishery. Now, why focus on the small pelagics? And in Ghana, the canoe fleet is very important. And when we talk about the canoe fleet in Ghana, we're not talking about very small vessels that you paddle along, but many of this fleet is motorized, uh, fishes far off at shore, and these vessels can be anywhere from 10 to 20 meters in, in length. Uh, but the canoe fleet really provides the, the majority of the employment in the fishery, uh, and also is the major, uh, uh, catches the most uh, fish in the marine area. And of the fish that the canoe fleet catches, most of that is small pelagic. And that's one of the reasons why we're focusing on that. Now, the other reason also is the food security and the food uh, linkage for people here in Ghana, that these small pelagics, as the first speaker mentioned, are very, uh, have high nutritional value. And here in Ghana, they're also low cost. So there really are a, uh, a good uh, local food supply for the poor. Now, another thing about the small pelagics is they grow very fast uh, and they produce, they're very fecund, so they produce, reproduce very, very quickly. And they can be round, rebound quickly if we put the right management measures uh, in place. So it is possible that if the right things are done and the stars align, over the life of the project, we might be able to see some real improvements in the fishery. Um, through this project, we, fought, we formed a science and technical working group that was trying to get better information on exactly what was happening uh, to the stocks. And in these two charts, what you can see is the abundance of the small pelagics in the ocean, the biomass, is well below that what's needed to maintain sustainable yields. 
And the fishing mortality or the fishing pressure, the number of vessels out there, the amount of time they spend at sea, is still well above uh, what's needed to both rebuild uh, the biomass in the ocean and then eventually uh, produce greater yields of fish um, in the long term. So that's some of the challenges we have is uh, not enough fish in the sea and too many fishermen chasing too few fish. So the project is uh, implementing uh, many of the approaches that were talked through by the other speakers, so I won't go into that, but trying to move from open access to managed access, managing at ecosystem scales, uh, participatory process, and also has a, a strong component integrating looking at post-harvest value chain improvements. And this is particularly important for women who are involved primarily in the post-harvest uh, processing of the fish and the smoking of the fish. Now, one of the visions that we really see and the hope for the project is if we can really work closely with the stakeholders and the government agencies in charge of fisheries management and put the right fisheries management measures in place, there's tens of thousands of metric tons of food protein supply that could be recouped that currently is lost because of poor uh, management. And if we can do that, we can also bring a lot more profitability, and fishermen and women can make more money in the value chain. Now, so what has to happen? So generally, uh, when we have a overfishing and an overcapacity situation, we need to reduce fishing effort. Recently, the Ghana uh, passed a, and adopted a National Marine Fisheries Management Plan that really sets out many of the um, measures that are needed uh, to reduce fishing effort and rebuild the fishery. And including in that is a significant reduction in the trawler fleet and a desire to cap the number of fishing vessels in the commercial and industrial fleets and also the canoe fleet, although the canoe fleet right now uh, several years ago, the canoes weren't even registered. So one of the first things that's happening is get all the canoes registered so we know how many there are. And there could be, there is on the order of about 12,000 canoes out there fishing. So once they're registered, then we can think about capping the number of them and ultimately then reducing the size of some of those fleets as well. Now, for the small pelagics, what works globally are closed seasons. Um, and if we can close seasons during the right time of the year, um, that can help uh, increase the abundance of fish in the sea. At present, however, the canoe uh, fleet is exempted. Uh, and one of the things our science and technical working group has done has talked about uh, the need to consider a closed season for the canoe fishery because they do make up the majority of the, uh, uh, the catch of the small pelagic. So if the canoe fleets are not included in that, the, the uh, reductions in fishing effort and the closure on the other fleets may not be enough to really have a significant impact. Now, the Science and Technical Working Group has, uh, pr has recommended a closure during the spawning season. So the idea here is to let the fish spawn and produce the next generation that can be harvested in subsequent years and uh, let the fish uh, grow to larger size before you harvest them. And in a number of regional stakeholder meetings that we've had with stakeholders, uh, a closed season was also one of the more, most preferred options of the stakeholders. So the stakeholders uh, do not want business as usual and are ready for change in the fishery. So the challenge now is really working to kind of implement some of the management measures that are in the plan and even considering additional measures that aren't in the plan yet but may be needed to kind of rebuild those fisheries. Now, another thing that's very important in our project and that's shown in this uh, slide is that there's another very big donor initiative here, World Bank supported West Africa Regional Fisheries Project. So on the left-hand column, you can see a number of the selected activities that uh, our project uh, that are needed or included in the National Fisheries Management Plan, and then what the USAID project is doing uh, to contribute to the uh, implementation and support the implementation of those initiatives uh, compared to what the uh, World Bank is doing. So it's very important to make sure that our efforts uh, of the two donors are very uh, complementary in what we're doing, and we've worked hard uh, working with the Fisheries Commission and the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development uh, to make sure that that happens. So one of the, just to highlight another thing that we're doing, and other speakers have talked about this, uh, stakeholder involvement in decision-making we feel is very much key and a good practice 
uh, in fisheries management globally and needs to be implemented here in Ghana. Now, one of the challenges has been is that the Fisheries Act and related regulations do not really explicitly talk about co-management. So there's a real need to consider uh, amending the legislation to ensure that the enabling conditions are better and promote co-management, which currently is not really done very strongly. But one of the things that we've been looking at, Ghana had an experiment in co-management about uh, 15 years ago that failed. And one of the reasons for that is they tried to use a cookie cutter approach where they wanted one, one system, uh, one approach to, to co-management for all types of fisheries and all types of locations. So in some of the meetings that we've been having with stakeholders, we've really been working to think about what is the management unit, the ecosystem that we're trying to manage in which the fisheries are contained, and then really think about that these sort of um, ecosystems need different uh, varieties of management approaches. So for small-scale uh, ecosystems like rivers and lakes, estuaries and lagoons, community-based management is considered to be probably more appropriate for managing these systems. But particularly in Ghana, we don't have reef, reef systems like you see uh, in the Philippines, but most of the fisheries here are large pelagics, small pelagics. They range widely throughout the country and the region. The fishermen follow the fish so that the management units have to be thought about at larger scales. And therefore, the co-management systems that need to be uh, developed uh, to support the management arrangements uh, need to be thought of a little bit differently. And they can't really be every single landing site and fishing community having a fisheries uh, community-based fisheries management plan or making uh, regulations that differ from place to place. You've got to look at it at a larger scale and a little bit more holistically. So in a nutshell, that kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that we're trying to do here in Ghana. Our project has been uh, in implementation for about a year and a half and has about another three and a half years to go. So we're still in the early phases of, uh, of the work that we're doing here. And I'm sure in a few more years, you can hear a lot more about many of the accomplishments that we're having. So I'd like to, at this stage, then turn it back to uh, Barbara um, and let her take over. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. As Rob mentioned, we would like to highlight several new and existing resources that are available to USA staff and our partners. Can someone take me to Andy? We're supposed to be having a meeting with Andy. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we are pleased to announce the release of a new briefing book on fishing for the future, the importance of wild fisheries to food security and nutrition. This briefing book presents evidence of the importance of wild fisheries in global development, from food security, nutrition, livelihoods, poverty reduction, the role of women, and climate adaptation. This report covers information from Rob's wonderful introduction, plus much more. The briefer also showcases several successful USAID fisheries programs in Bangladesh, Ghana, and the Philippines. And I've noticed that several people have asked if we're talking about marine or freshwater. Uh, we're talking about boats in terms of fisheries. The, the approaches are similar to both marine and freshwater uh, with some slight differences, but basically the same approaches. The briefing book also highlights the um, importance of fisheries in several key Feed the Future countries. Um, and so what's included in the briefing book are some key statistics showing, for example, example, what the percent of each country that is land or marine based, nutrition and food security statistics, such as the percentage of population experiencing food insecurity or stunting in children under five, and percentage of dietary animal protein from fish in their diet. The link to this resource is included in the AgriLinks website to this webinar and can also be found on USAID's Development Experience Clearinghouse or the DEC and the Biodiversity Conservation Gateway Portal. In addition, we produced several in-depth country profiles on the importance of wild fisheries to local food security in these same nine Feed the Future countries. The country profiles cover a range of topics as to how wild fisheries relate to broader development objectives and include some of the topics that you see here on the slide. Uh, the briefing book and country profiles were produced by the Food Security Integration Working Group, 
and we'll continue to move forward to look at, at ways that we can do a more integrated approach to food security development. In addition, several years ago, we produced a technical guide called Sustainable Fishing Responsible Aquaculture, which is still very relevant today. This guide provides basic information on how to design programs to reform wild fisheries, also called capture fisheries, and aquaculture or fish farming to ensure sound and effective development. Certainly, as Rob pointed out, in the face of food insecurity, global climate change, and increasing population imperative, that it's imperative that development programs help to maintain ecosystem resilience and the multiple goods and services that they provide, such as fish, by taking a more integrated approach to food security and development. We cannot afford to neglect global fisheries and expect aquaculture to fill that void. Global food security will not be achieved without reversing the decline of fisheries, restoring fisheries productivity, and moving towards more environmentally friendly and responsible aquaculture as well. And as Rod mentioned, this concept of secure tenure is important for both small-scale uh, farmers and small-scale fishers. And I think the presentations by Rare and also Ghana also emphasize this important role. So we are developing and piling resources to help implement secure tenure for small-scale fishers, as recommended by the FAO Voluntary Guidelines for, for Securing Small-Scale Fisheries. And securing marine and coastal tenure will also be critical for climate adaptations as we see rising sea levels and migrations of people. One reference is on small-scale fisheries and marine tenure. It's a pretty comprehensive source book on good practices and emerging themes. The other is a shorter primer called Looking to the Sea to Support Development Objectives. The primer has job, uh, job aids or assessment tools to help design marine programs. We have several pilots planned around marine tenure to test these assessment tools in the field. And I need to give a shout out to my colleague Stephen Brooks in our land tenure office who is leading these efforts, as well as the Tenure and Global Climate Change Program, which is helping us in this effort. So the presentations today covered the importance of wild fisheries to food security, nutrition, and livelihoods, with an emphasis on small-scale fisheries, and certainly have highlighted some of the approaches being taken to restore and enhance productivity in fisheries. Just a reminder that next week, on April 27th, please join us for an Ask Ag online chat, where we take a deeper dive into impact investing in wild fisheries. Now, at this time, we'd like to go to some of the questions um, that you have been sending to us. And please take this time to add other questions into the chat box. One of the questions that's been posed was talking about what is the role of women in wild fisheries. And maybe we could have both um, Brett and our Ghana colleagues uh, respond to that. Hello, this is Justice from Ghana. Um, when it comes to the role of women, um, basically in Ghana, women play a second role, first of all, in the processing of fish. And so um, they, they kind of have the, the capabilities to control um, what happens um, within the sector in the sense that sometimes they are even the financiers of this industry. Um, they are also very much involved in the marketing and the value chain of fish. So they have a very significant role. Um, I can speak more in terms of Ghana, but I know the dynamics may be different for other countries, but for Ghana, women have a strong role when it comes to wild fishes.
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zachary Bakke. I'm going to help uh, moderate some of the, the Q&A here. Um, I'm the Senior Knowledge Management Advisor for the Bureau for Food Security. And so going on to the next question, um, it's coming from uh, Claire Dawson, who is interested um, in, based on Mr. Jenks' comments about the value chain programs, what some specific challenges with small-scale fishery value chains are. What approaches have been considered to tackle them? Uh, Mr. Jenks? Uh, hold on one moment. Or... Brett, is your mic on? Perhaps he's stepped away. Um... Yep. Do other presenters have uh, any particular insight on uh, Ms. Dawson's question? Hello. This is Justice again from Ghana. Can you repeat the question? Okay, Justice. The question is, um, it's related to value chains, but what are some specific challenges with small-scale fishery value chains? What approaches have been considered to tackle them? OK. So basically, in Ghana, the, um, the value chain for fisheries is very informal. And so financing is one of the key issues that needs to be um, looked at. Um, so basically, it's, it's a very informal process, and that is usually led by women in terms of processing and marketing and making it available to the consumers. Um, for Ghana specifically, you could have fish um, that is processed, be dried or um, smoked, that goes all the way to the northern region in terms of Ghana and to other West African countries. However, there's limited funding um, in terms of these activities. And also one of the issues is the hygienic nature by which some of these products are handled. So there is a need to improve the market channels and develop them further and then provide women with best processing um, systems to help them to make these available and also to improve the product itself because very little value is added to the product. So as much as possible we want to improve the product to make it more valuable so that fisher folks can earn more money from that and then they may not have to you know um, harvest more fish. There's also the issue of post-harvest losses and handling um, that needs to be looked at. So basically, in summary, I would say that these are some of the challenges. Um, our project in Ghana is actually looking at some of the processing. Um, we are trying to help improve the fish smoking systems. We are introducing more efficient stoves um, for fish processing. We are also working with a lot of the women group organizations to let them understand um, the skills that they need to have to improve the products so that they can earn more from such products. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Um, our, one of our speakers, Brett, uh, had some uh, technical difficulties. He's rejoined the room. And so, Brett, uh, do you want me to uh, repeat the question about uh, challenges around value chains for um, small fisheries? Yeah, if you can, that would be great. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yep. Um, where did you go? Uh, so around value chain programs, what are some specific, specific challenges with small-scale fishery value chains? What approaches have been considered to tackle them? So this is, this is a, a very big question that everybody uh, faces as soon as you address what we think is the most basic question, which is that of, that of tenure. It's tough to start working on uh, value chains in any way without uh, rule of law, without enforcement, licensing, registration, without a secure tenure, 
um, it, it, it seems in many ways like um, without some of those basic assurances, it's pretty difficult to bring to bear any potential market reform. So let's, let's, let's assume first that those things are in place. Then um, in, in many ways, it's, it's like the world of, of smallholder agriculture, in which case for such disaggregated um, local units, there's, a, there's the, the need to organize around uh, cooperatives. There's a need to um, Im improve uh, the, the value of the product, whether in fisheries it's through drying, uh, through cold storage. Um, there are marketing opportunities uh, teaming up with you know, several sites in, in the Philippines where joining forces with uh, sustainable fish middlemen who whose procurement guidelines are being uh, merged with um, the Fish Forever production guidelines, in a sense. And that way, um, uh, th this, this buyer, this aggregator, is able to market a sustainably caught fish with a, you know, a, a, a uh, premium price garnering story uh, about the, 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 the benefits of uh, you know, the sustainable approach in these, in these communities. So whether it's a value-added technology, uh, or um, aggregation and marketing schemes, or delivering at a, at, to domestic markets. Uh, m much, most often, fishery reform by NGOs, uh, in our arena at least, has focused on premium um, commodities for export under uh, you know, some kind of certification uh, like MSC. Um, it's, it's not as common, but hopefully in, in the coming decade it will be much more common for these emerging market places to be able to uh, boost um, um, boost the value of these products in country, um, so that so that they don't need to be uh, exported. So that's a there, there's a variety of opportunities, and it seems like that you know I was talking with a friend of mine, Willie Foot from Root Capital, who's a leader in the smallholder agriculture finance arena, and we we talked about the possibility at some point of organizing. Um, I think he coined the, the the term a farmers to fishers exchange, where all of you folks in in the arena of smallholder ag could transfer your past 25 years of learning to small scale fisheries. There's a big opportunity there. Many of the same things, the same lessons apply. Thank you, Brett. This is Zachary again. So going on to our next question. This is for all the presenters. So uh, Luis Ramos has asked, um, do you have specific experiences in this, uh, in ways that we can learn from as around holistic landscapes and seascape approaches? What specific advice would you give in implementing landscape seascape approaches? So this is Brett. I'd be happy to, to um, at least think out loud about that. Um, depends on how you're defining, you know, what, what, what's the size of the seascape. But essentially, Luis, we've been working uh, increasingly um, on a pilot basis in the, the heart of the Philippines in a place called Tenyon Strait, where um, we're seeing increased adoption by municipal presidents and uh, local fishers of this turf reserve concept. And increasingly, it's expanding outward from villages managing their own small MPAs, which tr has traditionally been coastal resource management uh, uh, default practice uh, in the Philippines, to managing now turfs around those MPAs. And over time, there's even there's greater interest in expanding both of the size of the MPAs and, of course, the size of the turfs. Essentially, because of decentralization in the Philippines, each municipality manages its own water. So one could say that the municipal, the municipal waters up to 15 kilometers out from the coast in the Philippines are a turf. They just have not been managed as such. So there's a big opportunity to build networks of municipal turfs, and we have begun to do that. What's required is um, initially uh, a great deal of community participation, a collaboration between local authorities, uh, local fishers, a variety of stakeholders, and then a, a, a team of uh, steely uh, fisheries uh, ecologists and designers to help um, essentially chart out and map um, 
priority resource conservation areas, priority fishery recovery areas, um, building on the maps, the mental maps that fishers have of their own waters um, to achieve both uh, fish recovery, um, biodiversity conservation uh, practices, and then of course uh, equity. Uh, not, uh, not without its challenges, but um, over the course of the next, um, by the end of 2016, we hope to have uh, 20 such examples uh, just in these first couple of years from Indonesia and the Philippines. Thank you, Brett. Uh, do any of our other presenters have comments? Um, for additional kind of uh, context, we said put in that uh, in Central America, one of the problems is that the number of artisanal fishermen is growing. This probably implies that to protect coastal resources and oceans, a landscape approach looking upstream is needed to provide additional opportunities to the people um, so that the people will, will refrain from fishing from right space and no take zone mechanisms. Has Rare considered a more holistic landscape seascape approach? Are there experiences to be learned from? So we we have in I wouldn't say that would that would answer your question satisfactorily because about a multi generational um, um, land and sea strategy, because just in this case, we've only been at this for uh, a few years. I would say in in the Western Pacific, um, in Palau and Ponape, we've been working on um, what is essentially a terrestrial and marine joint strategy, working you know with a similar model of, of turfs and reserves, and then watershed protection upstream. But the populations are much smaller than what I imagine Luis is dealing with in certain coasts in Central America. So I don't, I, I wouldn't say that, I, I don't believe we've cracked that code yet. We certainly have some ideas, uh, but, but, but no. Thank you, Brett. Uh, are, do Hello. any of our other speakers have uh, comments? If not, no. Yeah, I would like to say a little bit about that in terms of the work in Ghana. So with USAID Ghana, we designed an integrated fisheries and coastal management project where we have one project looking at the seascape and another project looking at the landscape. Um, as you can understand, um, the landscape is very important to make sure that um, the seascape is, is also doing well in terms of mangroves and in terms of estuaries. But again, the issue of livelihoods, because of the significant decline of fisheries, um, it's important to look at alternative livelihoods for fishermen. Um, so our seascape program is looking at, our landscape program, sorry, is looking at working with fishermen and other farmers introduce alternative livelihood mechanism as well as some behavior change activities. We are also looking at improving the saving culture of fishermen and farmers. So we've introduced what we call as a village savings and loan um, program. So that gives, you know, help farmers and fishermen to kind of save something for the future and for periods where they are in need, in, when they are not getting enough um, cash from their livelihood. And this has really shown some promising figures at this point and there's a story where you know one farmer who would actually go into a coastal forest to you know hunt um, illegally because he was able to save some money through the village service and loan scheme he, he would not do that again you know and that alone has really helped in terms of looking at the issues of the wild fisheries and then the landscape issues. So there are many examples to give for Ghana, but for now I'll say um, just a few of this. Thank you. Thank you, Justice, and thank you, Brett, for your uh, comments. Uh, so for the next question, we had a few questions about co-management and the role of government. 
So what are the presenter's experiences in ensuring that adequate government participation in the, the, government, in the governance of fishing management? Uh, this is this is Brad. I'd say that's an absolutely critical question. And so while while Rare and his partners are working at, at the grassroots roots level with um, local fishers throughout um, five different countries now, uh, we're also working hand in hand with the uh, Ministry of Fisheries, Ministry of Environment, um, and local uh, local municipalities. So you know, form follows function in many ways, and and each country manages its fisheries differently. In some cases, like Belize, uh, which is a small country, there's a um, you know, national uh, fisheries office, uh, which uh, is part of the Ministry of Environment. And the fisheries officer there is, is the one who issues the, the licenses. So that it's a federal license. Um, in the case of um, the Philippines, uh, because of decentralization, uh, local municipal presidents, or mayors, uh, have essentially the jurisdiction over uh, their nearshore waters up to 15 kilometers off the coast. So it's a different different government relation, different system. In each of these cases, though, there need to be provisions at the national, sometimes subnational, and certainly local level uh, for uh, ways of securing uh, marine tenure and um, escalation uh, um, um, protocols for enforcement such in the case of, of the, the Philippines, where um, the LGU, or local government unit, uh, can, uh, essentially deputizes uh, local fishing groups to enforce their own local waters, uh, there has to be an escalation process uh, when they, in fact, encounter illegal fishers. Um, and so there's a legal systems that need to be put into place if they don't already exist. So that, that, those, those uh, um, that support locally and nationally is essential um, to create the kind of security that would enable any fisherman to trust uh, the system enough to work uh, within a, a turf and reserve uh, approach. All right. Thank you, Brett. Uh, do we have comments from any of our other presenters? OK. If not, uh, we'll go on to the next question. We have uh, Nina Javier Javeri uh, has a question for Brian. Uh, she has heard that the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure are being promoted, implemented in the fishery sector in Ghana. Do you have experience with this uh, in your USAID project um, working on this? Uh, this is also probably a question for Justice, too. Hello, this is Justice. Brian is not here, so I would want to take that um, question. But if you don't mind repeating it so that I can be clear on it. OK, Justice. Uh, so um, the person asking the question has heard that the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure are being promoted, implemented in the fisheries sector in Ghana. And she was wondering if Brian had experience with this in his project or has been involved with it. So basically, um, I'm not too sure we have that voluntary system here in Ghana. Um, however, what our project is trying to do as much as possible is to kind of give a voluntary compliance to some of the illegal fishing activities so that we t we educate the far uh, the fishermen in terms of some of the illegal things that they are doing and the need to have an ecosystem understanding of the impact of these activities on the marine fisheries and by and large they're beginning to understand that their actions is contributing to the significant decline of the marine fisheries catch in Ghana. And they're beginning to understand and appreciate the need to be involved in the collaborative management of the resources. So we are working with both government, we are working with communities, we are working with you know, the, the regulatory agencies to help 
to understand and to let everybody be on board and appreciate the need to have a collaborative management of the resources. So, for example, we've been supporting and giving trainings to the Marine Police. We've been giving some trainings to the judges and prosecutors. We've been giving trainings to local communities to support self-compliance and voluntary compliance. So we've been doing quite a number of things on that front. And but specifically to the guidance she's maybe she's she or he may be referring, I'm not too sure about that. Zachary, this is this is Brett. I wondered to add to Justice's uh, comments whether this person might also have been referring to the, the FAO uh, voluntary guidelines for securing small scale fisheries. Um, this is a um, major effort, major publication and the work of um, thousands of people in multiple countries um, who have put together under the auspices of FAO um, some strong guidelines uh, currently being adopted in a variety of countries that, that basically map very closely and I think would underscore many of the approaches that, um, that uh, this, this, this webinar has uh, covered. And I, I know that uh, Rebecca Metzner from FAO, I can see her on this chat group, uh, she may be able to post that resource for folks if they don't have it. Well, thank you, Brett, for um, that point to the resources. And Rebecca, if you have a chance, if you could share that resource on the, in the chat box, that would be great. Uh, and Nina, if you're still online, uh, if you want to provide a clarification, and perhaps Brett, uh, you can answer that in the, the chat box as well. So we're coming to the end. We're going to ask one um, final question um, before we wrap up. Uh, we have another question about co-management from Peter Limbu. Uh, what examples do presenters have about how fisheries uh, work um, to sustain their management costs, especially when it comes to fisheries co-management? Anyone want to jump in on that one? Yeah, Ch uh, Zachary, do you mind uh, really quickly just repeating that? Uh, I apologize. I was reading uh, through s several of the chat questions. <laughs> I know the chat box is always quite much more fascinating sometimes than the, the <laughs> pre presentation. But, uh, I do apologize. So the, this one was about co-management again from Peter Limbu. And what examples do presenters have about how fisheries work um, to sustain their management costs, especially when it comes to fisheries co-management? I think that's a really good question. We're, we, we have now, I, I think we're going to know a lot more about that in, in uh, a year or so, but with 50 of these um, turf reserves being set up in five countries um, across the world right now, it's clear that we're seeing local fishers begin to, um, in really meaningful ways, collaborate on the design and execution of their own enforcement schemes. And, and um, once tenure is secure and enforcement has begun, really the, the, the next logical step is um, serious focus on fisheries management. And that, of course, requires data and decision making and education. Um, but what's clear is, there is a great deal of interest from the part of um, formerly reluctant um, uh, fishers to get very deeply involved, uh, and we're starting to we're starting to see that in in a number of these cases. I'd have to ask our team if there if they have if there's anything, uh, we'd be happy to get back to you um, on a specific case or an example of how they're uh, driving establishing and then driving down management costs. Um, thank you, Brett. And so this brings us to the end of today's Ag Sector Council. I thank everyone for um, participating and for a very active discussion in the chat section. And thank you to the presenters for excellent presentations. We appreciate uh, um, you taking the time to, to uh, uh, share your knowledge and experiences with us. Right now you have the um, polls up. Uh, this is kind of our end of the session evaluation. Please take a moment before you leave to uh, 
fill out the, the polls, enter your experience. Uh, this is how we improve on uh, our ex sector councils going forward and also find new ideas to bring you uh, content for upcoming ex sector councils. So we appreciate your participation. Any last comments from uh, Barbara before we go? Yes. Um, I also want to thank everyone, both the presenters and the audience. This has been very informative. And I, I want to thank our BFS colleagues for co-organizing this with us. And I want to uh, remind everyone, and we hope to hear from you next week, we'll have a more in-depth discussion into impact investing in the fishery sector. Please go to the AgriLinks event uh, page for more information on that. And as uh, Zach just said, please take a moment to fill out these polls. So thanks to everyone.